Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother, Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the Scriptures. That's right. We love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for November 13th through 19th, 2023. This is covering the book of James. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the Scriptures. Scripture is so excited to read from you today. It's just so great every time we see you. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 17 minutes, 24 seconds. Not bad at all. What would that be daily? 2 minutes, 29 seconds. That is a time everyone can do. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it chapter by chapter. Otherwise, buckle up and we'll talk about them all together. But right before we get started, remember that a link to a PDF of all our quotes and graphics, as well as links from the episode, can be found in the description section below the YouTube video. We hope these will help you in your study. Also, there is an audio-only version of this podcast that is available wherever you subscribe to podcasts. Right. Well, this is exciting. Do you know what epistle we are studying today? What? James. Yes, John? No, no, James. Oh, yes, John. You know, this would be a lot funnier if our listeners knew that your full name was James. We <laughs> typically always call you Jay. Yes, John? So we are studying the book of James. <laughs> so why didn't we do this gag when we were studying the Gospel of John? Well, my name isn't spelled the same. Oh. Let's take our introduction from the 2016 Seminary Manual. The epistle states that it was authored by James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian tradition has held that this James, like Jude, is one of the sons of Joseph and Mary and hence a half-brother of Jesus Christ. The fact that James is mentioned first in the list of Jesus' brothers in Matthew 13.55 may indicate that he was the oldest of the half-brothers. Like the Lord's other half-brothers, James did not initially become a disciple of Jesus, However, after Jesus was resurrected, James was one of the individuals to whom Christ appeared as a resurrected being. Later, James became an apostle and, according to early Christian writers, the first bishop of the church in Jerusalem. As a leader in the church, he played a prominent role in the council held in Jerusalem. His influence in the church was no doubt strengthened by his kinship to Jesus. Yet James showed humility in introducing himself not as the brother of Jesus, but as a servant of the Lord. It is unknown when James wrote this letter. Since James lived in Jerusalem and watched over the affairs of the church there, he likely wrote his epistle from that area. The fact that James did not mention the Jerusalem conference about A.D. 50 could indicate that this letter was written before it took place, if this letter was indeed written before the Jerusalem conference, it is one of the first epistles in the New Testament to have been written. The general epistle of James is well known among members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for the significant passage in James 1.5 that led young Joseph Smith to seek for truth from God. Throughout his epistle, James emphasized that we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And as a side note, general epistle means that this was a letter to the entire church. Paul's epistles were written to specific congregations like the saints in Corinth, Philippi, or Rome, or sometimes he even wrote to specific people like Timothy and Titus. But the next seven epistles, after Hebrews, are general epistles. They are meant for the whole church of Jesus Christ. Well, this is exciting news, so let's get started in James chapter 1, starting in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Or the footnote with the Joseph Smith translation says, many afflictions. Going on in verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So why is patience important to have during struggles and afflictions? Perhaps it's important to allow struggles and afflictions to humble us, to 
change us, like Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. That requires patience, long-suffering, and trust in the Lord. Let's go on with verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, meaning freely or generously, and upbraideth not, meaning that God will not rebuke or criticize you, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. The Institute Manual adds this commentary, Every member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has been blessed by the declaration that James made, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. This simple but inspired passage motivated young Joseph Smith to turn to God for a heavenly answer. James 1.5 teaches that the heavens are not sealed, that God will reveal answers to those of any generation who ask him in faith, including us today. The Institute Manual also includes this great quote from Elder David A. Bednar. This is from an April 2008 General Conference. He says, quote, Notice the requirement to ask in faith, which I understand to mean the necessity to not only express, but to do. The dual obligation to both plead and to perform. The requirement to communicate and to act. Note the questions that guided Joseph's thinking and supplicating. My object in going to inquire of the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right, that I might know which to join. Joseph's questions focused not just on what he needed to know, but also on what was to be done. His prayer was not simply, which church is right? His question was, which church should I join? Joseph went to the grove to ask in faith, and he was determined to act. True faith is focused in and on the Lord Jesus Christ and always leads to righteous action. We press forward and persevere in the consecrated work of prayer after we say amen by acting upon the things we have expressed to Heavenly Father. Asking in faith requires honesty, effort, commitment, and persistence. Close quote. Awesome. Now, in the next few verses, James warned against being double-minded or wavering in loyalty and commitment to the Lord. James also wrote that the rich should become humble because earthly riches are only temporary and will soon pass away. Think about the temptations that we face today. Feel free to think about the temptations that you wrestle with personally. Let's take a look at what counsel we get as we go on in verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, or in the footnotes, the Joseph Smith translation says, resisteth temptation, going on. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. The Institute Manual adds this thought. While God is known to test the faith of his children, he is not the source of temptation. James taught that temptations do not come from God, but from the devil, who attempts to draw us away from righteousness by enticing us to do evil. The Greek verbs from which drawn away and enticed are translated refer to the traps and bait used when hunting and fishing. President M. Russell Ballard gave us this quote from the October 2010 General Conference. He says, quote, the use of artificial lures to fool and catch a fish is an example of the way Lucifer often tempts, deceives, and tries to ensnare us. Like the fly fisherman who knows that trout are driven by hunger, Lucifer knows our hunger or weaknesses and tempts us with counterfeit lures which, if taken, can cause us to be yanked from the stream of life into his unmerciful influence. End quote. 
That is a really good parallel. Nice commentary. Let's keep going in verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. So we show our love for the Lord by resisting temptation, which is one of the requirements for receiving the crown of eternal life. If you've studied with us in the past, you may remember one of our suggestions for feeling more comfortable with King James English. Have fun with it. (laughs) And few expressions are more inviting to have fun with than superfluity of naughtiness from (laughs) verse 21. It means an overflow of wickedness. Now, the fun is finding a way to use it in a modern sentence. Imagine the kids are getting into all sorts of trouble. Mud tracked into the house, cookies missing, up past their bedtime, whatever it is. Perhaps you could say, what is going on in here? A superfluity of naughtiness? (laughs) Start to use that phrase and wait for your child's kindergarten teacher to call and say, um, excuse me, Mr. Fulmer. When our class wouldn't settle down, Billy stood up and shouted, Cease this superfluity of naughtiness. Everyone was so confused that they just quietly stared at him. Where did he learn this phrase? (laughs) And then you can teach her all about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and she and her family will get baptized and be sealed in the temple, all because you had fun with the King James English. You're welcome. (laughs) Okay. But the Institute Manual Commentary tells us that this phrase, as funny as it sounds, means something quite serious. It says, As part of his teaching that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, James exhorted his readers to lay apart all superfluity of naughtiness. Naughtiness has come to connote petty or mischievous acts, such as the pranks of children. But this is a very inadequate translation of the Greek word James used, which is kakias. This Greek word not only meant evil in the general sense, but specifically hatred or bitterness toward another. Thus malice probably comes closest to the truest meaning. The Greek word translated superfluity is used in many other places in the New Testament. Typically, it is translated as abundance which gives the true sense of James's phrase, abundance of malice. That is great. Now, take a look at a young man that is described by Elder Quinton L. Cook. This is from an October 2014 general conference. He says, quote, I recently met a fine teenage young man. His goals were to go on a mission, obtain an education, marry in the temple, and have a faithful, happy family. I felt he genuinely wanted to go on a mission and was avoiding serious transgressions that would prohibit a mission, but his day-to-day conduct was not preparing him for the physical, emotional, social, intellectual, and spiritual challenges he would face. He had not learned to work hard. He was not serious about school or seminary. He attended church, but he had not read the Book of Mormon. He was spending a large amount of time on video games and social media. He seemed to think that showing up for his mission would be sufficient. Close quote. So how might the counsel of James help someone like this young man? Well, let's take a look at verse 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. James compared those who deceive themselves by hearing God's word, but neglecting to act in righteousness, to those who see their own reflection in a mirror, and then forget how they looked. 
Going on in verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The Institute Manual offers this commentary. It says, In his oft-quoted passage, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, James taught readers that it is not sufficient to hear the word of God. The Lord expects us to act upon gospel truths. The epistle of James focuses largely on helping readers to become doers of the word. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency explained, quote, It is not enough to know that God lives, that Jesus Christ is our Savior, and that the gospel is true. We must take the high road by acting upon that knowledge. Close quote. This is from the October 2004 General Conference. Nice. Let's go on with verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now check the footnote there. The Joseph Smith translation changes that to keep himself unspotted from the vices of the world. You might notice something really quite interesting in verse 27. The identification that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father. Here we're indicating Christ as God and distinct from the Father. If you want to know more about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, you can take a look at the Scripture Study Helps in your Gospel Library. Go to Guide to the Scriptures, and then take a look at Godhead, and it has a really good article about that. Now, we'll talk about this idea mentioned in 26 about bridling the tongue more later in the lesson when we get to chapter 3, but let's turn to the Institute Manual Commentary for verse 27. It says, James observed that caring for others, particularly widows and the fatherless, is a manifestation of pure religion. Anciently, widows and orphans were among the most underprivileged members of society and had few rights or opportunities. Thus, the Lord repeatedly commanded his people to care for them and for others in great need. While serving in the presidency of the Seventy, Elder Earl C. Tingey pleaded with church members to care for the widows around them. He says, quote, The term widows is used 34 times in the scriptures. In 23 of these passages, the term refers to widows and the fatherless. I believe the Lord has a tender feeling toward widows and the fatherless or orphans. He knows that they may have to rely more completely on him than on others. To the family and friends of widows, God knows of your service, and he may judge your works by how well you assist the widow. I know that the leaders of the church are concerned about the welfare of widows. We members should care for and assist the widows within our family, home, ward, and neighborhood. Close quote. This is from the April 2000 General Conference. Nice. And that brings us to James chapter 2. Let's start in verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Now the footnote tells us that the Greek actually renders more, not with partiality, have the faith of our Lord. And the Joseph Smith translation makes it even more clear. Ye cannot have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and yet have respect to persons. Going on with verse 2. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring, in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Wow, that is some powerful counsel. The Institute Manual says to have respect of persons means to show partiality or favoritism toward individuals. James condemned such biased treatment of others, specifically discrimination against the poor in favor of the rich. 
Other scriptures teach that followers of Christ should not discriminate on the basis of skin color, social standing, gender or nationality, education or economic standing, clothing or health, age or religious affiliation. By living in this way, we become more like our Heavenly Father, who is no respecter of persons. President Gordon B. Hinckley stated, quote, We must never forget that we live in a world of great diversity. The people of the earth are all our Father's children and are of many and varied religious persuasions. We must cultivate tolerance and appreciation and respect one another. We have differences of doctrine. This need not bring about animosity or any kind of holier-than-thou attitude. Close quote. This is from the April 1999 General Conference. Great. Now, in verses 5 through 7, James continued to reprove the saints who showed favoritism to the rich. He taught them that God had chosen the poor to be rich in faith and heirs to his kingdom. James also reminded the saints that it had been the rich who oppressed them and blasphemed against the Lord. Let's keep going in chapter 2, verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Now, faithful disciples of Jesus Christ love all people regardless of their circumstances. That's the royal law. Think of what we have learned this year about how the king of kings treated others, loving them regardless of their circumstances. What a great phrase, the royal law. The Institute Manual says, To exhort his readers to treat all people, both rich and poor, with charity, James quoted from Leviticus 19.18, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, labeling it the royal law. Royal means belonging to a king. This teaching parallels Jesus' command to love the Lord thy God and to love thy neighbor as thyself. Those who keep the royal law love everyone and avoid showing favoritism. Let's go on with verse 9. But if ye have respect to persons, again, this means showing partiality or favoritism towards others, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Ho, ho, that sounds harsh. But James is teaching that we become as if we were guilty of all, in that we are unclean. As Nephi taught, no unclean thing can dwell with God, from 1 Nephi 10.21. The 2016 Seminary Manual includes this quote from President Dieter F. Uchtdorf from the April 2015 General Conference. He says, quote, All is not lost. The grace of God is our great and everlasting hope. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the plan of mercy appeases the demands of justice and brings about means unto men that they may have faith unto repentance. Our sins, though they may be as scarlet, can become white as snow because our beloved Savior gave himself a ransom for all. An entrance into his everlasting kingdom is provided unto us. Close quote. Now, in verses 11 through 13, James provided an example of the principle taught in verse 10. He then encouraged believers to treat others mercifully, for those who treat others without mercy will be judged without mercy. But what if when we sin, we have faith that God will cleanse us? Is that enough? Let's take a look in chapter 2, starting in verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say, he hath faith? and have not works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone." Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. 
The Institute Manual tells us, James responded to reports of people who were speaking simplistically of faith as something separate from one's actions or works. It may be that the Apostle Paul's teachings were being distorted as they circulated orally among members of the church. Paul had emphasized that salvation came through faith in Jesus Christ and not through works or ceremonial performances of the Law of Moses. James used the term works in a different manner than Paul, referring to righteous deeds as the natural expression of belief. In response to those who suggested that one could have faith and have not works, James asked, Can faith save him? The Greek text of this phrase contains an article before faith. James meant, Can that kind of faith save him? James was not teaching that faith has no saving power. He was teaching that a passive belief that resulted in no action was not true saving faith. When James challenged his readers to show me thy faith without thy works, he was pointing out that it is not possible to show one's faith except through one's actions. True faith cannot exist apart from righteous works. In Lectures on Faith, we read that, quote, "...faith is not only the principle of action." but of power also in all intelligent beings, whether in heaven or on earth, end quote. Commenting on this statement, Elder David A. Bednar taught, quote, Thus faith in Christ leads to righteous action, which increases our spiritual capacity and power. Understanding that faith is a principle of action and of power inspires us to exercise our moral agency in compliance with gospel truth invites the redeeming and strengthening powers of the Savior's atonement into our lives and enlarges the power within us whereby we are agents unto ourselves, end quote. And that's from the April 2008 General Conference. Great stuff. Wonderful and great clarification. Let's keep going in verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. The footnote gives us a Joseph Smith translation that says, Thou hast made thyself like unto them, not being justified. This sounds brutal, but remember various devils that testified of Christ. In Mark chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 5, and in other places. Or of Paul as the servant of the Most High God, like we studied in Acts chapter 16. So even devils believe What sets us apart as believers is what we are willing to do. Let's keep going in verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Keeps driving that point home. From the talk that we referenced earlier in April 2008, Elder David A. Bednar also tells us, quote, True faith is focused in and on the Lord Jesus Christ and always leads to righteous action. Action alone is not faith in the Savior, but acting in accordance with correct principles is a central component of faith, end quote. Also, the seminary manual includes this quote from April 2021 General Conference. Here, President Russell M. Nelson says, quote, To do anything well requires effort. Becoming a true disciple of Jesus Christ is no exception. Increasing your faith and trust in Him takes effort. What would you do if you had more faith? Think about it. Write about it. Then receive more faith by doing something that requires more faith. Close quote. Awesome. Do you remember studying about Rahab in Joshua chapter 2 last year? We pointed out why she was such a big deal back then, but notice that the Jews of the New Testament time period also thought so. We noted that Paul used her as an example of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and now James is talking about her too. In verses 21 through 26, James referred to Abraham and Rahab as two examples of people whose faith in God was made manifest by their works. Remember that Rahab was a non-Israelite harlot, and because of her faith, she is reverently spoken of right alongside Father Abraham. What a tribute. Let's go on now to James chapter 3. Let's start in verse 2. For in many things we offend all, or we all make mistakes. 
If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Now, the NIV translation for verse 2 says it this way, if this helps. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Let's go on with the King James Version in verse 3. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter, or the footnote says, forest, a little fire kindleth. Interesting comparisons. A powerful horse, controlled with a small bit. A massive ship, controlled with a very small rudder. Great forests, a little fire can destroy it all. James goes on to compare the tongue to an untamed animal in verses 7 and 8, poison in verse 8, a fountain that delivers salt water and fresh, verses 11 and 12, and a fig tree that doesn't produce figs, but olives in verse 12. Have fun discussing ways in which the tongue is similar to these descriptors. I think the fire and forest analogy are quite good. One tiny spark becomes unstoppable if you let it. Also, you may have fun as a family drawing pictures of the various comparisons. The Institute Manual tells us James warned the saints of the potential ruin that unkind words, inappropriate language, or the loss of one's temper can cause. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles quoted from James chapter 3, verses 2 through 10, and then expressed the following about harsh or hurtful speech. Quote, Obviously, James doesn't mean our tongues are always iniquitous, nor that everything we say is full of deadly poison. But he clearly means that at least some things we say can be destructive, even venomous. And that is a chilling indictment for a Latter-day Saint. The voice that bears profound testimony, utters fervent prayer, and sings the hymns of Zion can be the same voice that berates and criticizes, embarrasses and demeans, inflicts pain and destroys the spirit of oneself and of others in the process. Husbands, you have been entrusted with the most sacred gift God can give you, a wife, a daughter of God, the mother of your children, who has voluntarily given herself to you for love and joyful companionship. Think of the kind things you said when you were courting. Think of the blessings you have given with hands placed lovingly upon her head. And then reflect on other moments characterized by cold, caustic, unbridled words. A husband who would never dream of striking his wife physically can break, if not her bones, then certainly her heart by the brutality of thoughtless or unkind speech. Wives, what of the unbridled tongue in your mouth, of the power for good or ill in your words? How is it that such a lovely voice could ever in a turn be so shrill, so biting, so acrid and untamed. A woman's words can be more piercing than any dagger ever forged, and they can drive the people they love to retreat beyond a barrier more distant than anyone in the beginning of that exchange could ever have imagined. May we try to be perfect men and women, in at least this one way now, by offending not in word, or more positively put, by speaking with a new tongue, the tongue of angels. Our words, like our deeds, should be filled with faith and hope and charity, the three great Christian imperatives so desperately needed in the world today. With such words, spoken under the influence of the Spirit, tears can be dried, hearts can be healed, lives can be elevated, hope can return confidence can prevail, end quote. That's so great. I don't think I've ever heard anybody speak more powerfully on that subject. Agreed. Love it. And I love these verses. I wonder 
how they might influence us when we are with each other or when we're on social media or texting. What a great invitation to reflect on them. Let's keep going in verse 9 of chapter 3. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. The seminary manual includes this great quote from Elder Robert S. Wood. This comes from the October 1999 General Conference. He says, quote, Our words and external expressions are not neutral, for they reflect both who we are and shape who we are becoming. What we say and how we present ourselves not only betray our inner person, but also mold that person, those around us, and finally, our whole society. Every day, each of us is implicated in obscuring the light or in chasing away the darkness. We have been called to invite the light and to be a light to sanctify ourselves and edify others. When we speak and act, we should ask whether our words and expressions are calculated to invite the powers of heaven into our lives and to invite all to come unto Christ. We must treat sacred things with reverence. We need to eliminate from our conversations the immodest and the lewd, the violent and the threatening the demeaning and the false. As the Apostle Peter wrote, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. The expression conversation refers here not only to speech, but also to our entire comportment. End quote. Great. Now in verses 13 through 18, James contrasted the world's wisdom with the wisdom that comes from God. The world's wisdom leads to confusion, like it says in verse 16, and strife, like it says in verse 14, while wisdom from above is pure and full of mercy, like it says in verse 17. And that brings us to James chapter 4. In the first three verses, James rebuked the saints for giving in to worldly desires. Let's take a look at verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. An interesting description of the relationship between God and the world. This does not mean that we should avoid associating with individuals who are not members of the church. Rather, we should avoid embracing the false teachings and unrighteous desires, standards, and practices of the world. Those things are an enemy of God. Let's go on with verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded." So how can we draw close to God so he will draw close to us? We can cleanse our hands and purify our hearts, like it says in verse 8. As used in the scriptures, hands can represent our actions, and the heart can represent our desires. So we might read it like this. We need to cleanse our actions and purify our desires. Nice. Going on in verse 9, be afflicted, or check the footnote, endure hardship or suffer harassment. Back to the verse, and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Let's skip to verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Wow. 
The 2016 Seminary Manual includes this quote from President James E. Faust. This is from the October 1997 General Conference. He says, quote, I fear that some of our greatest sins are sins of omission. These are some of the weightier matters of the law the Savior said we should not leave undone. These are the thoughtful, caring deeds we fail to do and feel so guilty for having neglected them. As a small boy on the farm during the searing heat of the summer, I remember my grandmother, Mary Finlinson, cooking our delicious meals on a hot wood stove. When the wood box next to the stove became empty, grandmother would silently pick up the box, go out to refill it from the pile of cedar wood outside, and bring the heavily laden box back into the house. I was so insensitive and interested in the conversation in the kitchen, I sat there and let my beloved grandmother refill the kitchen wood box. I feel ashamed of myself and have regretted my omission for all of my life. I hope someday to ask for her forgiveness. Close quote. So in what ways do we keep ourselves from becoming closer to God by what we omit to do, as well as the things that keep us from performing virtuous acts? Remember the questions that Elder Kim B. Clark encouraged us to ask the Lord, what am I doing that I should stop doing? And what am I not doing that I should start doing? This is from a Seminaries and Institute broadcast in 2015 called Encircled About with Fire, but it's also been quoted in General Conference. Now, those questions will definitely bring us closer to God. And that brings us to James chapter 5. In the first six verses, James condemned the rich who misused their wealth and persecuted the just. He warned that misery and judgment awaited them. The Institute Manual tells us, Prophets have warned repeatedly against pride and the evils that often accompany wealth. James specifically identified three areas of concern. One, hoarding wealth, as it mentions in verses 2 and 3, meaning accumulating so much material wealth that it sits unused and decaying. Two, failing to pay wages to employees, as it mentions in verse 4. Three, living a luxurious and self-indulgent lifestyle, as it says in verse 5. The day of slaughter, as it mentions in verse 5, may refer to the coming day of judgment. Much like cattle are fattened prior to their slaughter, so the wicked rich have fattened their hearts, unaware of the coming judgment against them. In verse 4, James wrote that the cries of those defrauded by their deceitful employers are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Sabaoth is a Hebrew word meaning hosts. Thus, Lord of Sabaoth means Lord of hosts. Great. Let's go on in verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The Institute Manual says, Farmers in ancient Israel waited patiently for the early rain of the planting season, which helped a seed to sprout and to grow, and for the latter rain, which helped plants to mature prior to harvesting. James used this imagery to teach that, like the farmer who must patiently tend the field and wait for the rains and eventual harvest, the righteous are to patiently preach the gospel and nurture one another, knowing that salvation will eventually come. Going on in verse 9, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. The Institute Manual says James cited Israel's prophets as an example of the patient endurance that all saints must have as they await the second coming of Jesus Christ. In our day, 
Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles specifically identified the Prophet Joseph Smith as an example of being patient in times of affliction. He said, quote, In our dispensation, the Prophet Joseph Smith endured all manner of opposition and hardship to bring to pass the desire of our Heavenly Father, the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph was harassed and hunted by angry mobs. He patiently endured poverty, humiliating charges, and unkind acts. His people were forcibly driven from town to town, from state to state. He was tarred and feathered. He was falsely charged and jailed. Joseph knew that if he were to stop going forward with this great work, his earthly trials would probably ease. But he could not stop because he knew who he was. He knew for what purpose he was placed on the earth, and he had the desire to do God's will. Close quote. That's from the April 1998 General Conference. Awesome. Let's go on with verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much." The Institute Manual tells us James 5.13-16 provides evidence that anointing the sick with oil so that they might be healed was practiced by authorized servants of the Lord in the early Christian church. President Dallin H. Oaks explained the modern practice of anointing the sick with oil. He said, quote, When someone has been anointed by the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood, the anointing is sealed by that same authority. To seal something means to affirm it, to make it binding for its intended purpose. When elders anoint a sick person and seal the anointing, they open the windows of heaven for the Lord to pour forth the blessing he wills for the person afflicted. President Brigham Young taught, When I lay hands on the sick, I expect the healing power and influence of God to pass through me to the patient and the disease to give way. When we are prepared... When we are holy vessels before the Lord, a stream of power from the Almighty can pass through the tabernacle of the administrator to the system of the patient, and the sick are made whole. Faith is essential for healing by the powers of heaven. The Book of Mormon even teaches that if there be no faith among the children of men, God can do no miracle among them. In a notable talk on administering to the sick, President Spencer W. Kimball said, The need of faith is often underestimated. The ill one and the family often seem to depend wholly on the power of the priesthood and the gift of healing that they hope the administering brethren may have, whereas the greater responsibility is with him who is blessed. The major element is the faith of the individual when that person is conscious and accountable. Thy faith hath made thee whole was repeated so often by the master that it almost became a chorus. As we exercise the undoubted power of the priesthood of God, and as we treasure his promise that he will hear and answer the prayer of faith, we must always remember that faith and the healing power of the priesthood cannot produce a result contrary to the will of him whose priesthood it is." That comes from the April 2010 General Conference. James also made a connection between the healing of the sick and forgiveness of sins. This statement may be based on the principle that the humility and faith required for a person to be healed are the same required for that person to receive forgiveness. Boy, those are some really good insights on that subject. Did you notice in verse 15 that it is through the prayer of faith and the power of the priesthood the sick can be healed? The prayer of faith is a powerful tool for healing that I have some experience with. When I was newly married, I had a headache come on me suddenly. I've had the occasional headache in my life, but I've never experienced anything like this before or since. It was relentless and overwhelming. 
I stumbled into the living room where my wife was preparing her lesson for her primary class and told her that I was going to lie down. She could see that I was in a bad way and shortly came in to check on me. I was in agony. She didn't know what to do and asked if I wanted her to say a prayer for me. She cradled my head in her arms and prayed that I would be healed. The pain was gone immediately and completely. I've never experienced anything so remarkable. Exhausted, I laid down for a peaceful sleep. The pain did not return. The reason I'm sharing that testimony with you, do not underestimate the prayer of faith. Going on in verses 17 through 20, James referred to the prophet Elijah as an example of someone who used the power of fervent prayer. He also counseled the saints to help sinners repent. Let's take a look at verse 20. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. The Institute Manual adds, James taught that when a sinner is converted and receives the ordinances of salvation, his sins are hidden, covered, or forgiven through the atonement of Jesus Christ, and he is saved from spiritual death. Latter-day Revelation provides the additional insight that the person who assisted in bringing about the conversion can also receive a remission of sins. Check out Doctrine and Covenants section 62, verse 3. So there it is. James. Yes, John? All right, that's enough. (laughs) (laughs) What an amazing book. And I think I've always loved the book of James, not just because it's my namesake, but the doctrines in here seem so applicable to me, especially the whole thing about the tongue being a small member. He speaks so boldly to help the saints to be unified and righteous and close with God. And he speaks surprisingly plainly. It's very easy to understand. Yeah. So what about you guys? Did you discover any gems? What are your favorite parts of the book of James? Feel free to share them with us. And make sure you share them with family and friends. Well, that's all the time we have for this lesson. Keep reading your scriptures, and we'll talk to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans. 